You have seen Dr. Bach on the platform a couple of times already this semester. He serves as senior professor or as the uh, uh, senior professor of New Testament studies, research professor, senior research professor of New <laughs> Testament studies. And uh, in a recent appointment that we uh, did, uh, we appointed him as the executive director for uh, the Center for Cultural Engagement, which is a, a team with our Center for Christian Leadership. And so in reality, it's the Center for Christian Leadership and Cultural Engagement these days. And so uh, he's been our platform, uh, and he has been uh, helping guide these discussions. Dr. Rick Taylor, uh, many of you know on our faculty, is Senior Professor of Old Testament Studies and directs our PhD uh, Studies program. So gentlemen, thank you. And the topic for today is this little fragment that has hit the news in the last two weeks that seems to indicate to some that Jesus was married. Why is that an issue? And how do we respond? Dr. Bach, Dr. Taylor, welcome. Would you welcome them to our chapel? Here? Thank you, Dr. Bailey. It's, uh, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a conversation talking about this text back and forth because there is expertise you can get in a seminary context that's hard to find in your local church. And that expertise extends to the language of Coptic um, this text is going to become so important that I think we're going to change the curriculum, offer four semesters of Coptic beginning the first <laughs> semester. And, uh, and so uh, I thought we would bring in uh, the man responsible for teaching Coptic on this campus uh, to talk to us about this text. And uh, so we're going to start first talking about the Coptic language and then talking about the text. And so I'll begin there. Let's talk about the Coptic language a little bit. Um, what is Coptic and uh, how difficult a language is it to learn? Well, uh, as an advertising blurb, it's extremely easy to learn. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, having a sense of where Coptic fits uh, in the broader linguistic picture might be helpful as we look at this document. Uh, Coptic belongs to a phylum of languages that we call Afro-Asiatic, and it consists of hundreds of uh, languages. One of about five branches of Afro-Asiatic is Egyptian. And Egyptian goes back uh, at least 5,000 years. And if we think of the progress of the Egyptian language, the part that you're probably most familiar with would be hieroglyphics. And that would go back to Old Egyptian in the third millennium BC. That phase of the language was followed by what we call Middle Egyptian that goes down to about the middle of the second millennium BC. And then a stage of Late Egyptian down to about 700 BC. There will be exam on this after he's all done. <laughs> and I'm trying to get to Coptic. Uh, <laughs> Around 700 BC, a more simple form of writing the language uh, developed, developed that was called demotic, kind of a cursive form of writing Egyptian. But when you come into the early Christian period, uh, because of the Greek influence in Egypt, uh, the practice was adopted of writing the Egyptian language using a borrowed Greek alphabet. Now. Egyptian has some sounds that Greek doesn't use, and so they tacked on about a half dozen letters to the end of the alphabet, and uh, that became the way of writing Egyptian in the early Christian period. When you look at a manuscript like we're going to do here in a moment that's written in Coptic, your first impression might be it's Greek. It is using Greek letters, but as soon as you try to read it, you know it's not Greek. It, it's something totally different from Greek. And Coptic developed into a variety of local dialects along the uh, region of the Nile. Uh, one of them is known as Sahidic, uh, which is the language of our text here this morning. But other Coptic dialects would be things like Bohiric, Fayyumic, Akmemic, a Middle Egyptian dialect of Coptic, and so forth. Uh, so that's where we are with Coptic. We're in a period of the early Christian period in a particular dialect of Egyptian that we call Sahidic. It's using a Greek alphabet to write a non-Greek language, namely Egyptian. And about what, 
twenty, twenty-five percent of the vocabulary is borrowed from Greek or so? Or well, is you that see these kinds of claims. It strikes me as being a bit high, but uh, some people will estimate that as much as maybe twenty percent or so of the vocabulary will be borrowed from Greek. We will see in this text some Greek loan words uh, like uh, disciple, mathetes in Greek. Uh, so Coptic typically does have a high number of Greek loan words, and that contributes further to this whole thing of it looking like Greek when you first glance at it, and it really isn't. Well, let me tell the story about how I found out about this text. I was eating lunch in my office uh, when uh, reading the New York Times article on this text when the New York Times called and asked for comment. Uh, I was actually in the process of running down the Coptic on one word in the text, the text, the, the word that's translated wife, because uh, I had the suspicion in my memory, since I don't do my devotions in Coptic regularly, I, 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 I had... Uh, this, this is appalling. <laughs> um, I, I was trying to recall whether there was a distinct word for wife or whether the word for wife is like German, where you say, in effect, my woman, and that indicates your wife, which is the case. And I had thought that was the case, and I was actually in the process of trying to run that down when uh, the reporter, uh, Lori Goldstein, for the New York Times called. And so she, she I, I had read through the text, so I knew what she was asking me, and I had read through the article on the text. And the first thing that came to my mind was, uh, well, even if this is authentic, and even if it says what it says, there are still questions about uh, how you read these texts. So I thought it would be helpful for us, one, to look at the text, and uh, to have someone with a translation there read through what these lines are saying, and then we'll discuss it together. So I think we have a display of the text available. Uh, there it is. Uh, if they'll scroll down that article for a second, you will see uh, a picture there in the corner of Karen King, who is the uh, scholar responsible for bringing this text to public attention. She uh, holds a chair, the oldest chair at Harvard Divinity School, and if you look at the picture, now scroll back down, there you go. She's holding in a frame uh, this text. Now, it's, in, it's not so easy to see the size of this text from that picture, but you get a sense of it. But uh, Dr. Taylor was good enough to bring uh, in a modern replica of the size of this text. Uh, that fragment is about uh, four centimeters by eight centimeters, or maybe an inch and a half by three. My business card is just a little bit larger than what that would be. So just visually get in mind the size of the uh, manuscript from that. So we're dealing with a very small text. It has, and you can count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then part of an eighth line. Uh, and we thought it would be appropriate to read this text to you so you can see and hear what it says. So I'm going to, I've got a what better deal than to have a, someone who knows Coptic uh, read this text for us? Uh, please don't think of the time when we, have, when we read Scripture in, in, in the text, but go ahead and read this text. No, I'm just going to give you a translation okay. of it. That's what you mean by that's reading. That's right. Yeah, that's okay. right. Uh, so the text is very fragmentary, and many of the lines are incomplete, so it's not going to make a lot of sense to you because of the uh, fragmentary nature of it. But in line one, uh, we have not to me, my mother gave to me the something. Line two, the disciples said to Jesus. Line three, deny Mary is not worthy of it. Line four, Jesus said to them, my wife, line five, she will be able to be my disciple and, line six, let wicked men swell up, seven, as for me, I exist with her because, and I cannot make out the word in the final line, line eight, uh, the people who have direct access to the manuscript have lighting techniques and such, and they tell us that the word is an, an image. I can't verify it from what I'm looking at there, but apparently the word image is in that last line. That's a very clear text, isn't it? 
<laughs> now, I think we might have a little fun with this. If you look at line four uh, of the fragment, can you find line four? Count down and find line four. And uh, the first word uh, in line four is a Coptic word that says pedje, pedje. And the next part of it is an abbreviation for the word for Jesus. You'll see a capital I and a capital S with a horizontal stroke over The them. S looks like a C. Looks like a C. Yep. That's what we call a nomen sacrum. And the nomina sacra are uh, sacred names that are regularly abbreviated in, in Greek and Coptic manuscripts. So that's the abbreviation for the word Jesus. And then it says uh, now to them. And now the controversial part um, in the second half of line four, ta hime. Looks like zyme, but it's that, the pronunciation is completely different than what we would think in English. So the T is the feminine article. That's what's being magnified right there. The A that follows makes it a possessive. So it's not the, but my. And then what follows that is the word hime. Uh, it's a shorter form of the Coptic word sehime, which means woman or female or wife. And with the possessive here, I think pretty clearly we're talking about wife. It's my woman in the sense of my wife. Many languages do this. In Hebrew, for example, isha is woman, or in certain contexts, wife. The same word can function both ways. Greek, gune, I think, mm -hmm. does the same thing in other languages as well. So let's just uh, do this together. I, th I think I want to have you pronounce the key part of the text here. And uh, so let me give it in two stages. I'll first of all say, Peje Jesus Nau. Do that with me. Peje Jesus Nau. Ta Hime. Ta Hime. We've been meeting for just 10 or so minutes. Already you're speaking Coptic. <laughs> uh, this is where the controversy is, is in this line of the text right here with that expression, my wife, coming from uh, the lips of, of Jesus. Now here are the issues that are wrapped up in this. Obviously you have eight lines. You have, a, you have a manuscript, you have a papyrus on which the ink is laid. So you've got the questions about and issues related to the papyri. You've got issues related to, uh, to, the, to the ink and the way in which the Coptic is written. And then of course you have the text itself, which has, we don't know where it came from, we don't know its origin. So it's out there by itself without any context. It's a contextless text, if I can say it that way. And as a contextless text, it's hard to interpret. The first thing that came to my mind when I was asked about this was passages in the New Testament related to uh, Jesus being uh, pictured as the groom for the church, which is his bride. And the next thing that came to my mind, because I have done work in Gnostic Christianity, was a sacrament known as the bridal chamber in which, uh, we, which sacramental sacramentalizes this relationship between Christ as the groom and the church as the bride. So I said to uh, the reporter calling that even if this mean, even if it's authentic, even if the, the ink and the, and the text are old, and even if it says everything that we have on the text, it may be nothing more than an allusion to this to this bridal chamber situation and have nothing to do with an actual marriage at all, but a strictly metaphorical reference to uh, this relationship between Christ and the church. And we have other texts that do this in a very tight context. Uh, we have texts in the Gospel of Thomas that do this in a very tight context, a very unusual way. The Gospel of Thomas 114 has Mary being defended by Jesus, but the defense is a little bit unusual. The defense is, is that Jesus will make Mary a male so she's qualified to enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, not exactly a text that the National Organization of Women are going to adopt as their life verse. <laughs> and, and, so, 
and, and so you have uh, these unusual associations in Gnostic Christianity that could be, it's just one explanation of what might be going on. Um, uh, Rick, let's talk, about, let's talk about the manuscript, Let, not the contents of the text, but the manuscript. Uh, what are people thinking and saying about that aspect of this find? Well, I think as you alluded to a moment ago, there really are two fundamental issues here that have to be separated. Uh, one is the age of the papyrus itself and whether it is authentic, and the other is the age of the writing that is on the papyrus and whether that is authentic. Um, there's probably not going to be so much controversy on the first point. This looks to me like a scrap of papyrus. It may very well come from the fourth or fifth century. I don't see any issue particularly with that part of it. The bigger question is what about the writing? Is it also ancient or is it possible that a more recent person, maybe even someone in the 20th century, uh, wrote on a scrap of paper, uh, papyrus that they had uh, come into possession of some way? Uh, so I think those are the two fundamental issues, and I think part of the way forward in this whole conversation is going to be the chemical analysis of that ink. They're going to have to test that and try to determine whether the f characteristics of the ink favor thinking it's ancient or more modern. And as far as I know, that testing is as yet incomplete. It hasn't been done, that's has, right. It hasn't been done. Karen King has said in her essay that they will do that. And I think uh, that's going to be very helpful if we can get a read on that ink and the, and the probable, probable age of, of the ink. I, I agree with Daryl that even if it, if it turns out to be uh, authentic and fourth century, uh, the idea that's being expressed here doesn't really surprise me that much. I mean, if you think about it, in the Gospels, one time uh, people come to Jesus and they say, your, your mother and your brethren are, are seeking you. And he uses that as a teaching moment to ask, who is my mother or my brother? And he says, it's whoever does the will of God. That is my mother or my brother. So there's an extended sense that that language can carry. Uh, you are a brother. You are a sister of Jesus. The writer of the Hebrews says he's not ashamed to call them brethren, quoting a, a psalm text there. Now, could somebody on the fringes of Egyptian Christianity take that language a step further? And in addition to, to talking about someone as Jesus' brother or Jesus' sister or Jesus' mother in this extended sense, uh, could you take it in the direction of Jesus' wife? So I, I don't see that that would be necessarily that unlikely by the, a group that is out there already on the fringes somewhere. You know, I actually got a follow-up call from the reporter who had talked to other people and came back to me when, about the way I was conceivably reading the text. And uh, the question was, well, this seems to be very individualized. And, and so the argument was that it wouldn't be metaphorical. But the point that I was trying to make is, in this text, you have three things juxtaposed very close to one another. The idea of Mary being worthy, which in the Gospel of Thomas, the very passage I just mentioned, it is the point of discussion. Is she worthy of the kingdom of God? Uh, and then Jesus gives this answer that I told you about in Thomas 1.14. So you've got that. You have the mention of disciple which certainly gives a spiritual feel to what's happening in the text. In fact, both of those allusions have that spiritual feel, and it's wrapped around the reference to wife. So the point that I was trying to make to the reporter was that here you have two clearly, seemingly spiritual references wrapped around the reference to the status, the social status of this person, which tells you you might be moving in a spiritual realm as opposed to in a strictly social realm. Uh, so that's, that's the issue that rotates around, uh, uh, around the wording. And the fact that we don't have a context means that we don't have any help. We're, we're left with the text by itself. One other feature that's important, you will sometimes hear discussion about this being second century, the teaching here. That's because most of these texts that we have, if they are authentic, uh, have come to us from about the fourth century, the Nag Hammadi being the, the chief collection of these kinds of texts, from Egypt. But the views that are represented often do extend back into groups that, that, that taught what they taught back in the second century. So that is an extrapolation from the normal way most of these kinds of texts work. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, good. The Nag Hammadi material that was discovered in 1945 in Egypt, even though these are Coptic manuscripts, the assumption is that they are translations of earlier Greek uh, material that goes back probably to the second half of the second century. Uh, we certainly can't prove that in a case like this because we don't have enough to work with, but people are talking about it that way because of the analogy to things like Gospel of Philip or Gospel of uh, Thomas and that sort of thing. Now, the, the last point I want to make, and, and, uh, and then we're going to transition to what do you do when a text like this comes out. And by the way, the microphones are here because if you have questions, do feel free to come up and ask them. Uh, the, the last thing that I want to transition to is the idea of we're actually very early in the examination of this text. Um, and so the idea that we can have one person give a scholarly presentation of it and know what this text is about, given how little we know about this text and how few people have looked at it, means, and this is the analogy that I've used, that we're kind of in the first period of a football game trying to assess what's going to happen through the whole thing. And so we're early. What normally happens with a text like this, and if you remember, there have been other examples of this. We've had the Gospel of Judas within the last six years that was released. We had a, a huge uh, discussion about that. There was a huge hype about what that text meant. It was vetted in the scholarly community over the next subsequent years. A couple of other major interpretations of that gospel emerged as a result. And I think it's fair to say that on the other end of that discussion that the first interpretation that was put forward that was the sensationalized interpretation is actually today regarded as the least likely of the three options on the table that scholars discuss with reference to the gospel of Judas. So I use that as an analogy. And my point is, is that when you get a text like this that is released with the sensationalism that this has been released with, you know, it's coming with a documentary uh, that the Smithsonian is running, that kind of thing. I think National Geographic may be having a hand in sponsoring it. Uh, what you will get initially uh, is, is kind of the first take. And you've got to have, unless a text has gone through a proper scholarly vet vetting where a lot of different people have looked at it and assessed it, uh, you really can't uh, know for sure uh, what's going on with it. Uh, Rick, would yeah, you I think that's a great point. I, what I would say in the context of any discussion like this is stay off the bandwagon. <laughs> You're going to get pressured to answer questions prematurely. Is this authentic? Is it inauthentic? I, I frankly don't know at this point. Uh, it does seem to me that people are speaking too confidently at times about it. I read a piece just in the last few days where the author is working with the Coptic text and arguing rather confidently that it's not authentic. But the basis of his argument uh, doesn't really hold together well, it seems to me. He may be right in his conclusion, but it won't necessarily be for the reasons that he's formulating. And so I think, uh, as Daryl said, there, there's, there's a scientific process that has to go uh, through with something like this, and I don't think we know enough at this point to be too confident about where the truth lies with this. Uh, if it turns out to be authentic, I think we can situate it pretty well within what we know of fourth century Egyptian Christianity uh, in light of the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Philip, and other such texts. If it turns out to be inauthentic, then that's another question. So I would say let's have a wait and see. Let's let the, the people who have direct access to the manuscript, uh, I'm looking at a copy here that can't be read too well because of lighting issues and that kind of thing. The people who have direct access to it can do the necessary chemical testing and analysis of the uh, papyrus and that sort of thing. And in a matter of time, we'll have a consensus that will emerge out of this, I think. My, actually, what I would like to see at this point there's been some talk of Harvard Theological Review withdrawing Karen King's uh, article on this text and not publishing it. I hope they don't do that. I hope they do publish her piece and then more or less immediately publish a similar scholarly article by someone who advocates uh, inauthenticity, maybe uh, Bentley Layton at Yale or Stephen M. L. at uh, uh, Munster or somebody like that. And, and then we can start seeing how these arguments stack up. But right now, we're in the early stages. Now, Daryl used the football metaphor. Maybe first quarter, I think maybe we're second quarter, maybe even third quarter, but we're not in the fourth quarter yet. 
Now, I, and, and the important thing about this is that there is a process of bet, vetting and reflection that comes. I see in the Christian community a tendency to want to uh, dismiss the possible authenticity of this text almost uh, off the bat. I got a series of emails during the week when I was speaking to the various media from Christians, and every one of them that was sent to me said, well, so-and-so says this is inauthentic, so-and-so says this is inauthentic, but I think what you have to do in the early stages is to think through the various scenarios that you have for possibility. It could be inauthentic, it could be an authentic piece of papyrus with the ink being light, which still makes it a forgery and it's inauthentic. Or it could be completely authentic and then you've got the question of, all right, what does it mean? And what did it mean? And so I think that's the process that you have to go through and I think you have to hold all those options uh, on the table, if you will, uh, until you have a better read and can find out more about this. You know, we may eventually find out where this text came from, for example. Uh, that kind of thing, and that might actually help us by getting a, giving us a setting for the text. All right, questions? My uh, question was in regards to context, regardless of its authenticity. Is uh, the, the sentence enough, uh, the references to disciples, Mary and Jesus, the sacred abbreviation, enough to compel us to believe that this is the New Testament Jesus? Or can we even argue that the, the ideas in such a condensed space is suspicious within itself? Yeah, that actually was one of the first emails that I got. Someone wrote me and said, well, how do we know this is the Jesus that was said? And actually, I saw two reports on national television that also made this appeal. Well, we don't even know what Jesus we're talking about. The suspicion I have here is, is that when you put Mary, disciple, the abbreviation of the divine name in the text, etc., the Jesus that you're talking about is, is at least a reference to the Jesus that we're all thinking about is being talked about. Let me say it that way. Let me make one other point that I didn't make earlier that's important. Everybody who has dealt with this text from Karen King on down has said, without exception, this text tells us nothing about the real historical Jesus. We should never lose that point in this conversation. As a Gnostic text from a fringe part of Egyptian Christianity, this does not put us in contact with the real historical Jesus. What it puts us in contact with, with, which is fascinating for scholars, is a movement, if it's authentic, is a movement of Egyptian Christianity in all likelihood uh, from around the fourth century. And that's part of the makeup of what was happening to Christianity in that period. And so for historians and students of early Christianity, it becomes an important text because if this text is authentic, we don't have any other text that uses this language with reference to Jesus, the idea of the, the, using the word wife. Uh, and it, coming, uh, thinking of his question, I, I would add too that even though uh, we have the features that Daryl mentioned, uh, abbreviation of the name Jesus, mention of Mary, discipleship, that type of thing. There, there also are commonalities in this text to what we see in Gospel of Philip and Gospel of uh, Thomas. There's no question about what they're talking about. That's right. The Jesus of the Gospels, albeit in a fringe and distorted sort of way. Those other texts, by the way, the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Philip are Gnostic texts that we think uh, have roots going back to the second century. In fact, this is part of the reason why people are, are, are saying if this is authentic, uh, we're probably dealing with a, some kind of a perhaps second century phenomenon. And so, uh, so those texts are rather full texts. Uh, they're long texts, they have context, we know what we're talking about here. Uh, and so that's when, when Dr. Taylor said earlier, there, there are people who are looking at this text are making assessments on the basis of the analogy of what we have. That actually is the background of the analogy of what we have. Okay, let's, we're, we're almost done with our time. Let me, just, let me just ask Dr. Taylor this question. When a text like this comes up, someone surfaces it, let, let's assume Let's assume that uh, someone off the street walked into your office and they handed you a, um, a uh, business card sized text that had Coptic on it and they said, I, I rummaged around Texas to find out how many people knew Coptic and your name came up. Uh, in fact, it was the only name that I heard. <laughs> Not true. No, the whole student body has done four years That's exactly Coptic. right. And so, uh, and so, um, uh, tell me what this text is. What 
process does and should a text go through? Should we really fault Dr. King for the, for the way she is attempting to bring this text to the public? Yeah, I don't think so. I think with something like this, you have a lot of initial uncertainties uh, that revolve around the question of authenticity. Now, how are you going to sort that out? One way scholarship advances is you have people making as strong a case for the one side as possible and then other people making as strong a case as possible for the other and through that kind of process we begin to see more clearly the strengths and weaknesses of various uh, points of view. So I think uh, what would be most helpful in this process is to have scholarly essays from both points of view vetted within the uh, scholarly community and that'll help us to, to move forward with this. So she takes the first step. She took the text to some people who had expertise in looking at the physical characteristics of this text to get their assessment to start off with. Then she began to uh, uh, gather together the information that they were telling her. She wrote up a piece. She presented it to a scholarly society. She then, at the same time, was making the public announcement. And then she said, I'm presenting this to the public and particularly to the scholarly community to assess. The one thing I think I might have done differently from the process that she followed is by the time she went to Rome to present this to the International Association for Coptic Studies a little over two weeks ago, I think, two to three weeks ago, the essay was already in the publication process. I, I, I wonder why she didn't wait until after the presentation at that professional group of Coptologists and get their feedback and then move ahead with publication after that. I, I, we're kind of premature a little bit, I think, in the process. I think that's often what is happening today. The same thing happened with the Go Gospel of Judas discussion in which there was a presentation public with, a, with, uh, with media behind it because there also was a special tie to that release which got the story out in a particular frame and then the assessment happened. I, I'm, I, this is actually the th third or fourth thing like this that's happened in my professional career lifetime that's gone in that format. And I remember the first time it happened when Christianity Today asked me about the process, I said, I think we're moving to a day where this is becoming more common, where what happens first is the scholar makes the presentation with their point of view. They sometimes have hooked up to a media uh, a connection to, to, give it, to give it more uh, attention and flair, and, and it does draw attention to their discipline as well. And then you get the vetting after the fact. Um, and, and so I think we're going to see this, and one of the reasons we actually wanted to have this chapel and talk about this in this way, in this kind of detail is, we wanted you to be alerted to, one, what the process could be, what the process should be, and also understand how to deal with the initial, <laughs> the initial um, release and the hype that tends to come with it, and then how to take a step back in order to allow a process that to some degree has been, uh, has been circumvented or shorted, shorted out, um, I'll give it the time to let itself play itself out a little more. Yeah, there's a tendency for us, to want, for us to want to be the first with the most. You know, they'd be the first one to come out with a conclusive decision, it is or it isn't authentic, whatever. Uh, more time is needed here. The dust has to settle with this and uh, a lot of what we're hearing in the news now is very speculative in nature, and much of it is eventually going to be shown to be uh, incorrect. And so that's why I would prefer to see a more reasoned process as opposed to the sensationalism that gets associated with this. And some of that sensationalism is probably intentional. I mean, the very fact that we're calling this um, at, at King's urging the, the gospel of Jesus' wife, that very name is sensational. I mean, is this a gospel? How are you defining the word gospel to, to apply it to this little exactly. text? I mean, th that, that genre classification is uh, suspicious to begin with. Uh, so the, the title itself, Gospel of Jesus' Wife, is uh, an attention grabber. It's trying to uh, garner attention in a way that I think is a little bit inappropriate. I'd like to see more neutrality here with some of this sort of thing. Well, uh, that's our topic for today. Let me close this up in a word of prayer and you'll be free. Uh, have a great weekend. Let me pray. Father, we do thank you for your goodness and your grace and for the way in which you have brought us into a world in which 
Um, issues like this um, do surface and get discussed, and some people, like Dr. Taylor, have given their lives to develop expertise that helps us uh, in the church with areas like this. We pray that the public discussion that rotates around this text would seek to understand it in its proper context, and that those of us who have the opportunity to speak to this text would do so in a way that communicates clearly what this passage might be and what it is not. We pray as well that as we um, go about representing you in the world that we do so with a calmness and a competence that is a good reflection of being your children. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.